Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the August August 2nd edition of Visual Radio 2012. It's Thursday night. We might talk to Buzzy Linhart. It's uh, 5 o'clock out there in Berkeley, California. You're going to hear his funny message. Uh, I don't think he's in, but that's okay. we got Johnny Byers. We've got Frank Delestrito. Might have Howard Gale tonight, musician. He's played with Peter Noon and Gene of the Young Rascals. We have lots of fun. We want the message. The message, Buzz. Where's the message? Here it is. I feel it coming. You reached Buzz Art Records and the Buzzy Linhard Medical Foundation. We're temporarily busy. Please leave your name and number at the sound of the tone, and I promise I'll get right back to you. Sit tight. Sit tight. Don't fight. Don't fight. Okay. That's enough. Seven eight one seven two one zero one three seven. See if you can get through. All right. So that's Buzzy Linhart. So let's see what's up tonight. Brand new telephone number for one of our guests. One of our frequent guests has moved. Marie from Kitty Connection will be joining us. Talked to her last night. She's babysitting tonight. And um, it's interesting. I'll write her number down. Hi, you have reached 781. Well, I guess he's not in either. Okay, so what we're going to do is we are going to call. Someone you all know, and I'm doing this show on the fly tonight, people, because um, it's just been a crazy day. Oh, okay, got it. Got the phone number. Great. Sorry about that. I should have had this written down a little earlier. There we go. So we just go to this. Eight oh two, fifty one. Seven seconds. It'll be eight oh three. Hello. Is Frank there? This is Frank. Would you like to talk about movies earlier tonight? All right. Hey, I saw Total Recall uh, Tuesday night. Oh, how was it? I haven't seen it. Did you like Metropolis? The silent movie. Yeah. Yeah, I liked it. Yeah. I'm surprised you're asking that as it compared to that. Yeah, and have you seen the original 1990 Schwarzenegger movie? Yes, I did. Okay, so when that was colorful and they went to Mars, this is a, a, the same story, but in a different setting. Colin Farrell is uh, Douglas Quaid, and there are only two inhabitable parts of Earth that are um, able, where people can breathe. England, which is New Britain, and the colony, which is Australia. They get there through a, uh, a tunnel through the earth, something called the fall. It's a big bus that you strap into, and it falls through the earth and goes to Britain from Australia, okay? All right. Um, Cohagen is in, Aust in, in Britain, and he wants to conquer Australia. So that's the premise in... Um, Colin Farrell goes to Recall, but it's all different. It's like an otherworld version of Total Recall. How did you like it? Uh, I thought Colin Farrell was excellent. Okay. I thought Jessica Biel was not as good as um, the woman who played Melina in the first movie. And Sharon Stone, Sharon Stone, and, and I sh should know the woman's name. I left the review in the car. Um, Eight seconds there, right? Huh? Eight seconds there. Well, that's in the new one. Okay. Sharon Stone oh. plays her part uh, in the old one. Okay. It, it, it's very funny as they... Um, I'm at the critic screening Tuesday night. 
and um, all the critics burst out laughing. It was one of those movies, usually Tuesday nights means that the, uh, the giveaway tickets from the radio stations are there, so you usually have 500 people and two rows of critics, right? But it was only two rows of critics. The public wasn't allowed to this. All right, and you were. Well, yeah, I'm a critic, and I've, go to, I've been going to these for like 15 years now. So uh, I'm in the theater with the critics. They all burst out laughing. First thing that comes up on the screen, it says original film. Okay. They're calling it an original film. And it's so reliant on the Verhoeven Total Recall from 1990. It's rather odd. What do you think of the Verhoeven Recall? I liked it. I liked it. It had color. It had action. A little cheeky, but fun. In a typical Terminator Arnold Schwarzenegger way, right? Yep. I, uh, I thought it, three, the first three quarters of it was a great movie, and I thought the ending just kind of fell apart for me. Until then, I thought it was a great movie. Yeah, you know, the eyes bulging out of the head and... Uh, yeah, it didn't do much for me. The whole thing with the uh, changing the atmosphere and all that, I thought that, was, that, that, that just didn't work for me. Well, that works better than this one. Uh, this one is good. It's an evening's entertainment. You may watch it again in a, in a couple of times, but um, there's good acting performances in it. It's just a little too busy. All right. Now, I saw Arbitrage yesterday with Richard Gere. Um, so, I'm not playing here yet. Yeah, so go ahead, tell me about it. Well, I can't talk about it on the air yet. I can tell you certain elements. Um, I may be interviewing the director in two weeks. And but what I can tell you is this: there are no guns in it. And in this, hello. Yeah, I'm here. In this um, total recall, man, it's guns, guns, guns. It's more guns than the Dark Knight Rises. And so there's a lot of blasting going on. Do more people die in Total Recall or in Dark Knight Rises? That's a good question. I think it's. Uh, You'd have to do a head count. Well, I haven't seen I haven't seen Total Recall, but I know Dark Knight Rises. You, you, I don't think you can count all those heads. <laughs> They're mowed down pretty quickly. Have you seen it? Dark Knight Rises. Yeah, I saw it. And your opinion? I thought, didn't we discuss it last week? I, I uh, a little maybe. Yeah, last week we said oh, I, I, I did not like it. I thought it was too long. I thought Bane was was good in his first scenes, but after a while he got awful monotonous. Yes. And uh, you and I both agreed big time that Anne Hathaway, the bull is a cat woman, should have been at the center of the film instead of kind of peripheral. And it could have been less violent. It could have been cat and mouse, if you will, or cat and bat. Yes, it could have been that. It certainly could have been less violent. It was an extremely violent film. And... Um, so no, I, I I would have yeah I would have liked the the duel of wits. I, as I said last week, I thought Anne Hathaway and Christian Bale had very good chemistry on screen. Yes. I wish they would have I wish they would have run with that. Bane got kind of boring after a while. What did you think of the James Bondish woman, uh, who bought the company? Uh but she was, I mean, she was, you know, she was kind of on the peripheral through most of the movie. And all of a sudden, I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but she's right in the center of it at the end. But I guess that's okay. But I, I, I was wanting to see more Anne Hathaway. Yeah, they kind of uh, diluted it by having two women vying for Batman's affections. Yeah. Well, yeah. they they do that in Batman movies. I mean, um, what is it? Batman you, Forever had the Riddler and Split Face. Uh, Tommy Lee Jones is Split Two Face, I guess, and uh, Jim Carrey is the Riddler. Nobody remembers Tommy Lee Jones in it, and they should have just gotten him out of there and uh, and uh, sent it on more on Jim Carrey. And um, yeah, they, they like they like double villains in the Batman movies. I'm not always sure it works for them. No, it, it, it's it's overabundance, and uh, for a Playboy like Bruce Wayne, it's overcompensation because here in these movies he's a playboy and in the old comic books he's some older guy with a young ward. So, uh, but, you know, Chick-fil-A won't be uh, sponsoring it anytime soon. I, well, I don't know. 
I mean, that's, that's my. I'm just being funny. I'm just being my funny <laughs> self. It's ridiculous. Well, no, no, I, I mean, uh, and there's been the the homoerotic element of Batman and Robin has been talked about for many, many years before you and I were around. Right. And uh, I didn't. I didn't think these movies made it all that. Uh, uh, harped on it all that much, but the uh, the comic books were criticized for that in the 50s. When there, there was a crackdown on comic books in the early 50s as being unhealthy for kids, and one of the one of the elements was the uh, homoeroticism of Batman and Robin. Well, and then when I was in seventh grade, uh, they t the nuns told us the communists were behind the comic books. Okay, well. You know, uh, I, I somehow maybe um, McCarthy got to them. I don't know. McCarthy got to the nuns. Yeah, well. McCarthy is. Well, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a, that'd be the subject of a great documentary. There was a big outcry over comic books in the early 1950s, about the same time as the Red Scare. So maybe McCarthy. Uh, oh, right, it's coming back to me now. Actually, Joseph McCarthy was involved in that. He was, he was, uh, he kind of cut his teeth on the comic book scare, and then he moved on to the Red Scare. Well, you know, it makes sense because uh, Captain America in the 40s, The Red Skull, and these are very American books, Superman, Batman, and then all of a sudden you had that lull, and then Marvel Comics came back, gangbusters in the 60s, uh -huh. gangbusters, uh, the house of ideas, uh, Stan Lee and, and Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko were brilliant, there's no way of, around it. But they had the they had the foundation, and they were able to take it and capitalize on it, and reinvent heroes that um, create new ones and have heroes that already existed. It was a, a very nice concept. Yeah. And, and you know, Frank, those days were different. The movies were different. The Roger Corman movies were actually very compelling on the big screen, don't you think? I I uh, you know Roger Corman is. When he wrote his autobiography, he talked mainly about how he didn't lose money and how how sharp he was at making money for low budgets. But I think a lot of his his very low budget stuff from the fifties holds up quite well today. In fact, I think most of his low budget stuff from the fifties holds up better than his bigger budget stuff from the early sixties. I've been uh, I've been watching his uh, Edgar Allan Poe Vincent Price movies, and they're getting dated. Whereas um, Bucket of Blood. Uh, Buck of My Blood is my favorite early Corman film, and that was made for nothing, and I, I just think that is a, such a swell movie. And, uh, let's see, most people like the, what's, Little Shop of Horror is better. Uh, uh, to me, that's okay, but I think Buck of Blood is his masterpiece. And uh, the beginning of the end, another really low-budget uh, nuclear fallout-type movie, holds up very well today. And, uh, you know, you get... You, if you can't, if you can't, kind of go with the low budget, they say, okay, they had no budget for special effects. They had no budget for the exotic monsters. This one is a really schlocky looking monster. If you can't get past that, you can't get past it, and the movie's lousy for you. But if that doesn't bother you, I think there's a, these movies have a lot going for them. Now, Last Man on Earth was not Corman. No, that wasn't Corman. But it was Vincent Price, and I think it's one of my favorite of the black and white movies of that era. It certainly, it certainly has its own tone. It's a, uh, it's a movie that is really easy to turn off halfway through, but if you stick with it, uh, it's a lot better than you you might think midway through. And uh, now I think that was I, 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 not my era. I think that was mainly Italian. So that's why you may not know anybody behind the screen. I don't think you know anybody in the movie except Vincent Price. It's been a while since I've seen it. And I remember, I almost turned it off, because I was watching it late at night, and I thought, it was kind of boring, and then, and then it picked up. So, yeah, I, I agree with it. But, it has a, but the thing I like about it is, it, I mean, there's no, uh, you, know, you, can turn on a, you can turn on a movie and say, okay, that, you know, you're watching a few minutes, and just from the tone of it, you say it fits into this genre, it must be from this year, it must be, might even be from this director. This one is, I think, is very unique. Not a great movie, but I... Uh, it's, uh, it's more interesting than it ought to be. And it's very, it, it runs parallel with Night of the Living Dead. Black and white, a man fighting the uh, zombies. Yep. Um, yep, there's a, lot, there's a lot of similarity there. And it's probably where George Romero got a lot of his ideas. Right, I, maybe. You, know, you mentioned there is a lot of similarity there. 
I don't recall the Omega Man. I saw it back when it came out, 70, 1970, 71. Uh, Charlton Heston is uh, remaking the Vincent uh, Price movie. I don't think I've seen it since first release, so I don't want to talk about it because I can barely remember it. Yeah, i got to pick up the uh, DVD or something. Yeah. Um, so have you seen anything else other than The Dark Knight? Let's see. I, we went and saw the Woody Allen movie, uh, To Rome With Love, or From Rome With, to Rome with Love. Did you and your wife enjoy it? I, I would say we enjoyed it, but it wasn't great. I, I mean, uh, la his movie last year, uh, Paris After Midnight, was a masterpiece. I thought that was, you know, it was nominated for Best Picture. I was kind of, it was a dark horse, and I was kind of pulling for it because it was a, you know, a, a small film in a sense, but it all worked. This one had a bit too many stories for me. It was, uh, and to, to be honest, I think Woody Allen should be a director and not an actor now. I think I'm liking his movies better when he's not in them. I didn't think his character was, his character was more diversion because he's been telling, you know, it's kind of the same shtick always with his characters coming up with these one-liners, which aren't that good anymore. I would have gotten rid of his story and uh, concentrated on some of the other characters. There's four stories running parallel in it. It's not, it's not that long a movie. It's nowhere near as long as The Dark Knight. <laughs> and uh, so, I mean, they're jumping around. And, they, and uh, you know, when, you, when, I, when I think a story is going well, you kind of hate to see it shift to the other story that you're not just not interested in. And uh, there, I, you know, I don't want to spoil it for you. I mean, there is, a, there is a subplot which is kind of absurdist, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and I think they went a bit too far with that. But I would have liked it to be a tighter film. I thought... Uh, the Paris movie, uh, Paris at the Midnight, didn't roam like this one did, but no, no pun intended. This one was kind of all over the map, and it didn't. It would have been a better movie if it, if it hadn't been. Interesting. I, uh, saw, I, I also went and saw The Amazing Spider-Man. Okay. And uh, and I and I liked the Spider-Man. I thought the kid did a good job. The movie was, you know, as everyone's saying, I, I hate to agree with the masses, but I think they're right. It's kind of a been there, I've done that. I, I the the original Spider-Man movie of how long ago was it now? Eight years? Not that long. It's been about uh, 10 or tw 10, 12 years. That meant that long? Okay. Well, I, I loved it. I was I walked out of there a fan. And I didn't care at all for the, the sequels. But uh, I, the first movie I thought was great. And this movie this movie was fine. I mean, you, you, you had to have been there, done that feeling you did. But I... I I thought the, and I, I'm embarrassed to say, uh, I don't remember the act, the name of the actor who played the Spider-Man. Andrew Garfield. Andrew Garfield. I thought he did a fine job. Uh, I was never a big Tobey Maguire fan. He was a bit, bit too uh, boy next door for me. To, and and, uh, and you can see, in, and you can see in this Spider-Man a, a dark side that I thought uh, was, was appealing. But the movie didn't have a lot to offer. Not, not a lot new to offer. Yeah. Well, you know. They kept it on track because the lizard would have been in the Tobey Maguire 4 movie. Mm -hmm. And it would have been, oh, what's his name? I'm, I know that actor very well. He, he played in Dr. Connors in the uh, original Spider-Man movies. He was in Disclosure. I should know his name. But anyway, um, he's a character actor that shows up in a lot of movies. Random Hearts. Um, but that's okay. He, uh, they were going to go to the lizard anyway. What do you think of the lizard? Too Godzilla-ish? Uh, once, uh, once they take the actor out and put the computer graphics in, it loses something for me. Yeah. Now, you, you can take the movie audiences of the world and divide them into two. There's those for whom the special effects, the CGI, the 3D, uh, you, when you, even when you, I didn't watch the movie in 3D, Quite frankly, those glasses start to bother me after a while, so I'd rather see it in 2D. And, uh, but you can always tell when they're going for a 3D effect when something comes right at the screen or something like that. There, as I said, you can take the movie audiences of the world. There's, there's those who, for whom that makes it a better movie no matter what. And uh, as I said before on this show, it, for me, that makes a good movie better and a bad movie worse. It just, mm -hmm. And this movie, I guess, was on the cusp. And um, another thing, if I, if I can just rant a little bit about the modern CGI and all that, they feel compelled to make the fight scenes longer. And I, I, think, it, 
I think in ninety percent of the action movies, they let the fight scenes go on too long because they they got all that money wrapped up in uh, special effects, and by God, they're going to get their they're going to get their payback out of it. And you know, for me, it's, you know, it's like a dance. Dances have a certain length, and then it's over. You bow and leave the audience. But if it goes on and on, you say, "What are we doing here?" You know, you haven't got anything new to show me. So uh, that's that's my. That's You're right. You're right about this. Against CGI. These fight scenes and these car chases in the new Total Recall, they have a car chase that really this director, Wiseman, could have picked it right up out of Colin Farrell's other movie with Tom Cruise there, The uh, Minority Report. And, you know, you got the cars that are flying and just take that scene out of Minority Report and save some money and put it in Total Recall because that's what they did. Um, you know, it's been there, done that, you said earlier. One of the, the first CG movie they claim was The Last Starfighter with Lance Guest. Remember that? I haven't seen it, so go ahead, though. Oh, I've seen it a zillion times. The Last Starfighter, the premise is that the kid, uh, it's, there's this community in the Midwest, and there's a computer uh, game like Pac-Man, but only one of those Star Wars things, right? Oh. And, and they're recruiting someone to go to the frontier, and they're looking for a starfighter, so the games are out there so that the aliens can find a really good starfighter from Earth. And Lance Guest, lo and behold, is the starfighter. So, Lance Guest was supposed to become the next big star, and this was going to be like Star Wars. It never happened. Mm -hmm. But about 30 years later, they're going to do a sequel, finally. So the first CG movie, The Last Starfighter, which had computer graphics for the spaceships, they will finally do a sequel 30 years later with Lance Guest, who ended up in, like, Jaws 4. It was, like, I think the last time we really heard from him. Well, how, uh, so what is he, about 60 now or so? Well, he was young in that movie. He was, like, about 20, so he's probably 50 now, you know? Okay. Well, I'm still young enough to be an action hero if he stayed in shape. Hey, you know, I went on Jan uh, Roger Moore's website last night, and he's, like, 84 years old, mm -hmm. and, and he's got an itinerary. It's, like, you know... Roger Moore on tour, the Moore tour. It's like, it's very impressive, you know, these guys are still out there. Well, if you're that age and you've kept doing it, that's fine. But once you stop, it's hard to restart. Well, I think he's on the lecture circuit, obviously, um, which I think is a fine thing for rock musicians and film actors. Go out there and lecture, because I think they have a lot to say. They've seen a side of the world we haven't. My two bits. Hey, so t t See, tonight's movie is a Laurel Hardy movie, right? You took the words out of my mouth. Utopia. Utopia. What's your favorite Laurel and Hardy movie? Laurel and Hardy. Never a big fan. Never were? No. Were you a fan of, um, uh, God, the titles are messing <laughs> Anyway, I, I grew up on them. They were on every Saturday, and I was a big fan of, of Laurel and Hardy. And then in the 60s, uh, one of the afternoon shows had all their shorts, because they made, they made feature films, but they made lots of shorts, and I, I really, really came to appreciate them. And this, this, is their, this is their last film. It's their most difficult film, because it, everything went, seemed to go wrong on it, and it's no doubt the film that took the longest to make, because I think they were, what, they were 13 months on it, because everything kept going wrong. So this really drained them. And... Uh, I couldn't tell the difference between Abbott and Costello and Martin and Lewis. No, only kidding. Yeah, well, you know, Laura Hardy in the 30s, Abbott and Costello in the 40s, Martin Lewis in the 50s, uh, you, you can almost see the, the evolution of American comedy in, in those three because they, they're, they're so different, but you know, there's a tie between them. And uh, the, the, uh, Abbott and Costello had the rapid-fire dialogue in there. Their timing was really sharp, which is one of the reasons they broke up in the 50s, because as they got older, the timing got harder and harder to keep up, and, and finally, I think it was uh, Costello, they, they, had a, they had a Las Vegas act in the 50s, and it, the timing just wasn't there anymore, so they, and then they just broke it off. And Gee, how do you lose the timing? Uh, the, uh, well, you know, to be honest, they both drank too much, for that, so that was one thing. There you go. And in those days, uh, you know, they, they joke about it, you know, that, that uh, 70 is the new 50 and all that. But it's really true. I mean, the people, people are doing a lot better in later years than they used to. So, uh, 
you know, we're going, you go back, not in, in our lifetimes, early lifetimes. The person 60 was, you know, not not a retirement age, but he was, they were, they were, they were older than they are now at 60. Absolutely. Me too, I'm kind of, I'm kind of hoping that's true now that, I, now that I'm 62. And, uh, and, but, you know, the people, you know, the diet, the, medic, the medical thing, and, and, and the abuse. You, know, you read about these old movie stars, they all smoke, by our standards, they smoke too much, they drank too much, they didn't take care of themselves. And part of the result is they had shorter careers. But they didn't know it. There, there wasn't the medical information at the time, and it made them look cool to drink and smoke on screen. Yeah, and, uh, I mean, I mean, they were. I mean, Don Costello, by by a lot of standards, were temperate men. They weren't. They weren't wild men like some of the movie stars. But you know, I mean, it, it took a toll. And they. Uh, so let's see. Nineteen fifty-five. Abbott would have been fifty-nine. Costello would have only been fifty. Fifty. Oh, forty-nine. He wasn't even fifty yet. Uh, but they. I mean, if you watch their movies, I mean, I. My favorite movie of all time is Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein. And if you watch the movies before then, that's when I, I that's when I say the razor sharp time. They could go back and forth, and like the, their famous routine, "Who's on first? That is all timing. Because when you read the dialogue, it you know it doesn't make you laugh, but when you see them perform it, it's it's hilarious. But after nineteen, after Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, after nineteen forty eight, if you watch the movies, there's a precipitous decline in the quality of the movies, and you start. You know, you really get the feel, even if you're seeing the movie for the, you know, even if you've never seen Abbott and Costello before, if you watch one of their later films, the early 50s, you get the feeling they've been doing this too long. And I think that was it. Uh, some people get better like fine wine, fine wine and some just um, fizzle out. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, I really think they needed new material. I think the, uh, the, uh, the jokes got, you know, they, everything they... Actually, everything they did in Abbott and Costello beat Frankenstein. All their gags, all they had basically done before. But I, you know, I think that was the last, the last hurrah for them, really getting it, making it look fresh and new. After that, it just didn't look fresh anymore. I have trouble watching a, a Abbott and Costello movie from the early fifties because I, you know, you, you look at me, see, you know, it's like it's like watching an athlete in his last year of play. You say, gee, whether he's good or bad today, he's not what he was, and he'll never be that way again. You know, I'm, I'm very uh, fond of these old actors now making these movies. Um, Redgrave in Mission Impossible, she was just magnificent. As, uh, 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 oh, what was the, uh, Max. Max. So you didn't know if Max was a man or a woman. You assumed it was a man, and then it turned out to be her. Uh, she was just wonderful. And Clint Eastwood, I think, unlike Michael Keaton, who, I don't who like Woody Allen, shouldn't be directing and acting in movies now. Maybe they should just direct... Uh, I think Clint Eastwood does a fine job of acting and directing. Yeah. So well, again, I mean, you know, he's one of our. You know, he, he actually, is, I, I guess, Clint Eastwood is pushing eighty, right? But, uh, but uh, yeah, he's still productive. Yeah, but I mean that you know that is a generation after Abbott and Costello, after the guys in the fifties. Uh, if you look at well, if you look at like Clark Gable, I would, I would, you know. Nobody, had, when he was alive, would say Clark Gable was the greatest actor in the world, but I would say there's nobody's acting from the 1930s that dates better. Uh, his, his acting, uh, you know, Spencer Tracy, Lionel Barrymore, the so-called great actors of the 1930s. If you watch them now, they, their styles seem a little stilted. It's a little too, uh, it's either uh, hammy or affected. I think Lionel Barrymore was a terrible ham. Spencer Tracy seems, he doesn't seem to be acting it's you tell it's a guy playing a role, whereas I think Clark Gable, you see his his big films from the uh, 30s. I think he's just so natural, but he didn't age particularly well. You know, he died. Uh, you know, by our standards, a very young man, 59. But you can you can see the years had taken their toll on him, not on his acting talent, but just on his his uh, physical appearance. And uh, you know, had, had he been alive in our generation, he would have been making. You know, he would have looked a lot better at age 59 than he did when he. Uh, when he made the misfits for whatever that was a, a you know a you know he's still a very attractive man but he was obviously much older than the than the uh, the guy of a few years before to uh, wrap up on utopia and then i have to get to my next guest who's ringing my cell phone um okay it's we've reviewed it before the final flick uh but it did despite all the problems it's still a good movie yeah 
I, I actually, there's kind of two movies in one here. There's the, the first part when they in, inherit the boat, take a sailing trip and get to the island. That's kind of a replay of their classic routines, their sight gags. Either you like that or they don't. I think the movie really regenerates itself when they get to the island. That has a stronger plot, and they fit into it well. Uh, just a couple things for the viewers to watch. Laurel was not a, good, a healthy man for the whole movie. And that's one of the reasons it slows down. You can see that he's not he's uh, he's not in good health, and uh, and uh, Oliver Hardy is just enormous. He was well over three hundred pounds, and right after this movie, his doctor told him, "You lose weight or you're dead." And he actually got down to like hundred and forty pounds before he died. Wow! And if you if you go online, I think if you go online and Google Oliver Hardy one hundred and forty pounds, photographs will pop up, and you, and you just can't believe that's the same man. <laughs> Well, I'll leave you with this thought. My next guest is Buzzy Linhart, and we're doing his album, Electric Lady Dream. It was the first album by a band known as Utopia. All right. How's that That's for... a great thought to leave you with. I'll talk to you next week. Thanks. Have a good one, man. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Frank Delastrito, and uh, Buzzy's been calling us. We didn't have time to finish up on his album. Buzzy. I thought today was Wednesday. I'm so sorry, but I'm home now. That's okay. What I did was I flipped. Instead of talking to you first, I talked to Frank Delastrito first instead of second. Okay. Now, here's the Shaka Pifi. We've got to do our book Shaka Pifi because we were discussing the movie for tomorrow night at 9 o'clock, which is Utopia. Oh, no. By Abbott and Costello. Right. And your album is Utopia by Buzzy Linhart. This is Utopia, Laurel, Laurel and Hardy? Yeah, Laurel and Hardy. Thank you. Yeah. Laurel and Hardy. Um, Oliver Hardy, who uh, was, I guess, 300 pounds in the movie, got down to 140 pounds, and then died. And then died. Well, it, it saved money on a casket. <laughs> Are we on the air now? We're on the air, and we have an audience. Who's the audience? Oh, uh, Believe it or not, it's it's Louise from three hours north of London. She's visiting her cousin down in uh, San Diego, and they drove up for the afternoon to say hi. Could she do a station ID? This is Louise on visual radio. Oh, yeah. Okay, Vic, this is Louise. What do you want me to say again? This is Louise on visual radio. This is Louise on visual radio. Yeah, listen to See, I'm the visual, you're the radio. They see me, they, they hear you. Okay. This is Louise on visual radio. All the way from London. Oh, well, no, Southampton in Hampshire, actually. Oh. Yeah, that and, Louise. Oh, <laughs> I love your accent. Yeah, thank you, and yours. I'll hey. hand you back to the man. Thank you. Yeah. Buzzy, you have colorful people around you all the time. You have to do a movie. I know. We should. We will. So the Shaka Pifi is Utopia. Well, Utopia is the movie, the last um, movie by last. Oliver Hardy and um, his partner there, <laughs> Laurel, Stan Laurel. And you were the first Utopia. So their Utopia was the last movie, and your Utopia was the first album. That's right, before they were called Utopia. And somehow this TV show had to get that out to the world. That Utopia was the last movie by Albert and Costello and the first record album for the band Utopia, Electric Lady Dream. It's reincarnated. Yeah, it came back to life. And we have uh, 26 minutes, so let's go track by track, Buzzy. What do you open the new album with? Um, you know, we have not completed the, uh, the order, the programming order, so uh, that would be hard to say yet, as of yet. So let's start with Kirkpatrick's uh, defeat. It will not be on the Buzzard version of this album because uh, we want to get it out fast and we don't have permission yet to use that record. And unfortunately, in, in the business, to be 
totally safe. You you want to get signatures first, or you could wind up in court. Now, isn't there a different um, version on the Moogie? For further notice, Moogie's song can't be on the record. Now, did you and Moogie do another version on the radio? Um, yes, but not not one that's been released as of yet. That's a very rare tape that I haven't heard myself in years. So, wouldn't you? Could you put that on Electric Lady Dream? Uh, it would all end. Uh, art, I'm Buzz. He's Art. We're Buzz Art. He's the expert in that, and uh, and he would feel uh, he would feel that we wouldn't want to take a chance on uh, on offending somebody. And right. It, uh, By putting an alternate take. Got it. And uh, the Lieber and Stola track won't be on this either, right? It will not also. And and we also have to skip the Fred Neal and the Tim Harden song. So uh, to me, it's <coughs> it's a rather bleak lineup compared to the original. There will be a, uh, uh, a bootleg, I hear, available of the original. And we'll give people uh, details on that in the future. But it can't be... Uh, can't be on my current label, otherwise uh, we could all get hauled into court. Whoa. So this is, um, boy, you know, like um, last week or the week before, uh, I was interviewing a guitar player. It was last week, and um, Jay Giles' band is touring. And do you know they're touring without Jay Giles? Really? And I'm like, okay. I mean, we kind of broke it here. It was in the Globe. But it hadn't really been on radio or TV yet, and it's like, oops, sorry, I, I had no idea. And the YouTube is kind of like getting a lot of hits now because people want to hear that conversation about Jay Giles not being in the Jay Giles band as they tour. Uh-huh. So he wants the name, I guess, um, and he's got paperwork out there that he believes the name is his, where he's Jay Giles. And the rest of the guys, you know, I used to manage Danny Klein, the uh, bass player. I see. The rest of the guys are out there as Jay Giles band, and they're touring. They've got Duke Levine on guitar, who's very, very good. This, this is something that uh, people should uh, uh, take precautions with in the future and try to make sure that uh, if the band has a following, that uh, they can continue to put out records without... Uh, these side effects. It, it's, it's an ever-changing, ever-evolving world. And, and um, y you know, I don't know, Buzzy, if I like that Foreigner goes out there with a new lead singer that sounds like Lou Graham, and he's supposed to be terrific, and Journey has a singer that sounds like, you know, Steve Perry. Yes. But they're clone bands. If for all intents and purposes, it's a clone band. That's right. It's no different than uh, a local band doing... Uh do, a tribute to Buzzy Linhart. Either call it a tribute or have the original members. Yeah, that um, would be strange to have a Buzzy Linhart tour without me on it. Well, the Buzzy Linhart tribute band, you know. Um, they do it for Jimi Hendrix. Uh, I'm surprised you haven't done one yet with the Hendrix estate. They have, uh, you know, Buddy Guy goes out and they all do Hendrix tunes. I see. Well... I've just never talked to them, and I guess uh, it's something I should try to do in the near future. Yeah, actually, um, that, that is a good idea. We'll have to talk off, off camera about that. That would be a good thing for you. Go on one of those Hendrix tours, because you were friends with Jimmy and you played with him. Um, that being said, so four tracks Maybe won't be done. To, go, to let me go if I can meet Buddy Guy. So. <laughs> Buddy's a wonderful man. I've had lunch with Buddy. I used to produce him back in 86. Uh, a show for him, but I didn't get to meet him. Ah. Now, Buzzy, so there's four tracks missing. How many tracks are you putting out? Um, we're going to put out the same amount of tracks. It's nine, but uh, it'll be different songs. We felt we should at least equal the, uh, the amount of time, but there'll be... Uh, some uh, rare and until now uh, unavailable uh, Buzzy Linhart songs. And there'll be a couple, at, at least one with the, the great Maruga Booker and, and Chaos, uh, guys, friends of mine, who I did a band with, who uh, recorded with George Clinton. 
and uh, I'll tell you, those songs are really, really impressive. And the thing that that's uh, making me happy is to see that they do fit uh, the format of my life. Uh, and they fit right in with the stuff that we did in 1971. And I think that's uh, at least shows I have a integrity of some sort. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay, so this is all new news since our last conversation, which was uh, on the 19th, I believe, of uh, July. Yes, I didn't get to mention that to you at the time, but Art and I have decided to, to pack it with more songs. So Electric Lady Dream will be a totally new release? Yes, it sure will. Separate from the music album. Um, can you go over any of the tracks and, what you, uh, and your thoughts on them? Absolutely. All right, throw a track at us. At, at, at one time, well, we'll, we'll, we'll mention uh, uh, Talk About a Morning because it was uh, Jimmy's favorite song out of all of them uh, at the time of his passing. And uh, Eddie Kramer, the great producer and engineer of, of all of Jimmy's uh, official records, uh, says that uh, when he came in to, uh, to rehearse with the tape machines running and start recording for the last album, which was eventually called The Cry of Love, uh, Jimmy would come in and when he was tuning his guitars, uh, would look over at Eddie and say, play that song. And he would play Talk About a Morning up to 10 times in a row, uh, Eddie says. And, uh, and so when anybody came to audition the sound of the studio, because it was a brand new studio owned by Jimi Hendrix and everybody, of course, wanted to be there, but they still had to hear what it sounded like, and uh, they were treated to uh, talk about a morning, seal the deal for uh, a whole series of it, at least 15 albums that came out of Electric Lady Studio Gold. Nice. Now, how did you write the song? When did it evolve? You know, I was listening uh, when it came out. We're on the air, Miss Lara. We're on, the, we're on the radio. I love your singing, but it might not work out in editing. Wouldn't want to jump over to another song and scare everybody. Um, Talk About a Morning was inspired by Good Day Sunshine on the Revolver album by The Beatles. It had been out for only a couple of weeks, and uh, the, that particular day... Um, um, I was living with a friend of ours uh, uh, in her spare room with Mary Snow. Uh, um, we're on the air, guy. Uh, living with Mary Snow. Mary got went to work, and I got up and uh, and listened to Good Day Sunshine maybe ten times before I went hopped the cab and went over to the Seventh Sons rehearsal loft. Uh, and when I got there, I sat down and I was practicing in the opening, uh, uh, open G tuning that someone had taught me. And it turned into talk about a morning very easily. And I like to think that that, uh, that, that exuberance that's inherent to Good Day Sunshine is somehow appearing in the song Talk About a Morning. I think it was talking about the same thing. And as far as I know, it's the first time, and it's probably not completely so, but to my knowledge, it's the first time in the history of music that the term the now, the now, was referred to. Second verse, the yesterday is miles away, and the now is feeling fine. Ooh, I like it. Might sing another line. So uh, that's where it came from. Now, and, The Seventh uh, Sons was um, a different time period than the music people, right? Yes. So, but you still had the loft. Um, well, oh, this was, you wrote it earlier. You, you had it in your back pocket for this album. You had written it a couple of years earlier? 
Yes. Got it. I wrote it uh, the year that that Revolver came out. I believe that was 1965 or 66. And uh, uh, didn't record it till 1969. And uh, I actually recorded it in, in, in London. It was one of the cuts that was not used on the original album, Buzzy's Buzz, or Buzzy uh, with small caps or small letters, Buzzy on the, the uh, uh, Phillips Mercury album at the time. Boy, maybe I can ask UMG if they've got it in the vaults. I would sure like to hear it. Also, we did The Love Still Growing. Wouldn't you like to hear those songs done by the the, uh, the band from Swansea, Wales? Yeah, so you, you did these outtakes, huh? Yeah. Well, they were completed. It's just uh, we had too many songs in the end. So how many outtakes did uh, how many extra songs were they done for the Buzzy album? Um, I believe there was at least three extra songs. Nice. Uh, we were actually we did that's the bag I'm in also, but it didn't make the cut that that album. Boy, it's very stimulating to think back to all that. And it's great to get her on tape, Buzzy. You know, we our audio is coming out much better. Uh, Anthony and I. God bless him, Anthony Gamari in there. We, we've, been, we've been working with the audio, and I can literally see the, um, in the studio room, I can see the audio going up um, in a vertical line. It's pretty right. cool. Getting more complete. It's vertical instead of horizontal. <laughs> Great. And so I'm seeing a line going up and down. Up and down is vertical, correct? Yes. Horizontal is... Side to side. Right. As Olivia Newton-John sings in physical, horizontally, let's get physical. Horizontally, get it? That's why. Physical. Yeah. The great song. That hit number one. I got to track down John Farah and interview him. He had his people reach out to me, Buzzy, as you did, to thank me for the reviews. Isn't that neat? Yeah. And Captain and Tennille's people did it, too. Oh. Um, but um, I'm going back to a lot of those old allmusic.com reviews and putting them up on my Top 40 blog. That's great, Joe. Because there's so much of it, and we don't want to lose all that information because it was hard writing. You know, I wrote Total Recall today, which is the new movie with Colin Farrell. Oh, you wrote the, your review of the new uh, Total Recall? It comes out tonight at midnight, so I write them in the afternoon, and then both publications I write for can spring them at midnight. Got it? Are, yeah. Are you allowed to... Tell us uh, how you felt about it. Did you see Metropolis, the old uh, classic? Yes, I did, but uh, it's been 20 years ago. And did you see Arnold Schwarzenegger in the original Total Recall? Yes, I did. Okay, so this is a Philip K. Dick novel. We can buy it for you wholesale about memories and buying memories. Are you go into a chair and you can go to Cancun, Mexico, or anywhere you want, Australia, he was uh, in the top, uh, you know, in the top ten or so um, <laughs> finest writers uh, of sci-fi at the time. So very famous writer. I thought the original by Verhoeven and, and, and Della Strito and I just talked about it. Uh, it had some great moments and it was very colorful. This movie has no color, way too many guns. Okay, and um, Colin Farrell's very, very good in it. I like him better than Arnold for this part. Oh, great. But uh, Kate Beckinsale, the girls in the original movie have more chemistry and more subtle violence, if you will. Uh-huh. Subtle violence. Here the violence is in your face. So now you were saying it lacked color. You mean flavoring type color? Because uh... No, real color. It's very bleak. You know, this whole Blade Runner thing of having dark science fiction movies, I'm getting very tired of it. Uh-huh. Everything's got to be... Uh, if you want to do a dark movie, do a black and white movie. What is it making a color film that's dark and very metropolis, and they've got some... Easier to keep, really, to keep continuity uh, if you want to really be technical about it. You know, if you use a certain effect, you can, you can hide imperfections uh, and make it match more easily if it's less subtle. And the odd thing is there's some very sleek and very modern... Um, areas, the shuttle, the fall. 
Um, there are only two colonies left on Earth, Australia and uh, New Britain, which is England. See, I'm not reviewing the movie. I'm just giving you the details, which is allowable. I see. Sure. Uh, and the fall goes right through the center of the Earth. So when they want to go from Australia to Britain, they get in the shuttle, and it just takes 17 minutes. They fly through the Earth. When they get to the core, it's um, no magnetized or, or magnetized or something, so there's no gravity. And then they go to Britain. It's very, very odd. Um, and it's okay. It was an evening entertainment, but for this great premise, this great science fiction novella, and all of the fans that really liked Verhoeven's work with Schwarzenegger, I felt a sequel would have been better than a rebooting, okay? Yeah, because you lose too much of the original. A sequel would have been much, much better. And that's what the fans have wanted for 22 years, since 1990. 22 years, and the fans uh, are given a new version of it. So oh. I'll, I'll let everyone make up their own mind when they see it tonight at midnight. And uh, You and I should talk more movies a lot more. We've got four minutes left, Buzzy. Should we attack one more song from the album? Yes, please. Which one? Um... Gee, uh, if you love me, just because it pops to mind, it's it's um, it's very interesting. It's got quite a hook a hook to it. The ba ba da 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 da. It it's it's a real strong hook. And uh, may I re recite the lyrics? Is sure. Possible? You own them. Go for it. If you love me, never leave me. If you leave me, you don't love me. How can we hang on to a dream? Which is a line I got from Tim Harden. Uh, uh, Colin, Colin Bluntstone was hung up on a dream. The zombies. Gotcha. Okay. First, if you leave me, you don't love me. Uh, you're beneath me. I'm above you. <laughs> How can we hang on to a dream? The interesting thing is that when we get to the solo, we just go into a, a straight blues shuffle, and it's a, it's a, I don't mean it's, it's, it's a, it's a, a straight blues is, 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 but the shuffle is uh, dotted quarter notes rather than straight quarter notes, dot, 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 dot even uh, in the solo goes into dot, 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 Da, 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 da. And that's, I've always uh, thought that ended the interest song. And Doug Rodriguez at, 19, at uh, 22 takes an amazing solo. And uh, we go back to the straight four and end the song. Uh, nothing much else to say except uh, um, a couple of young people hearing it for the first time felt that they could hear the influence that we actually had on Steely Dan, a band who opened for us back in those days. And uh, uh, a lot of people feel that, that there was a real in, in, influence that I got to uh, provide that's kind of noticeable on the music album. Well, this is great, Buzzy. We got two songs down tonight. And we talked about the demo that got the deal. Do you remember any specific song Eddie Kramer heard at the studio? Um, when we were auditioning our tape to him? Yeah. Um, yeah, but it didn't make the album, so uh, um, let me see if I can think of another one. What was the one that didn't make the album? Uh, it was a remake of a famous song, 50s hit called Let's Go Steady by the Pearls on the Onyx label and uh, it was really good but uh, one of the problems in life for, uh, for a musician and especially one who likes to do other people's songs uh, it, it can just reach a point where it's more money than the budget will allow and um, 
at something that I, I think is very interesting and uh, a lot of people would be interested to know that any song that you use on a record that's by someone else, you have to pay nine and a half cents at this uh, time. And that's our show for tonight. We got five seconds left, Buzz. Put it in half between the promoter or the uh, publisher.